This morning we continue our study of baptism in the early church based on the book of that title, a copy of which is on the table at uh, the entrance uh, to this meeting space. Yesterday we looked at the question, what is distinctive of Christian baptism? by examining baptism against the background of other uses of water for purification in the Greco-Roman and Jewish worlds. And we saw that the baptism of John the Baptist was the most important uh, antecedent to uh, Christian baptism. Uh, Today we're going to look at what does history say about early Christian uh, baptism as we consider baptism in early Christian non-canonical literature. I am omitting the New Testament material on the assumption that it is well known. I realize that is not a safe assumption to make uh, even for church members uh, these days but perhaps it is a safe assumption for you who attend the ACU Summit Anyway, I thought it would be more valuable to you to acquaint you with literature that is less well known. And so we'll give some selections from early Christian literature in the period from the 2nd to the 4th centuries. I'll begin with some early accounts of uh, baptism. Uh, The earliest uh, that we have comes from a document known as the Didache. We do not know the date of this document. It is usually dated somewhere about the year 100. The document says in chapter 7, concerning baptism, baptize in this way. After speaking all these words, this is a reference to the first six chapters containing moral instructions on Christian living. Baptize into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in living water. That's running water. If you do not have living water, baptize in other water. If you're not able in cold water, in warm. If you do not have either, pour water on the head three times into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before the baptism, the one baptizing, the one being baptized, and others, if they are able, are to observe a preliminary fast. Notice that the baptism is in the Trinitarian name. The wording is exactly that of Matthew 28, verse 19. The document has many affinities with uh, Judaism, and one of those is the preference for uh, running water for uh, purification purposes. The alternative of pouring is a fourth choice in the document, and uh, the author uses a different verb from baptize. Baptize meaning to immerse, but when he talks about pouring, he uses a different verb and says that the pouring is to be three times. I take that to mean an effort to cover the body with, uh, with the water. A second account I want us to look at is from the middle of the second century, uh, Justin Martyr's uh, first apology. We shall explain in what way we dedicated ourselves to God and were made new through Christ, lest by omitting this we may seem to act deceptively in our explanation. As many as are persuaded and believe that the things said and taught by us are true, and promise to be able to live accordingly, are taught while fasting to pray and ask God for the forgiveness of past sins while we pray and fast together with them. Then they are led by us to where there is water, and in the manner of the regeneration by which we ourselves were regenerated, they are regenerated. Uh, Justin here uses the 
a Greek verb uh, based on the wording of uh, John 3 verse 5 and uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. For at that time uh, they are washed in the water in the name of God the Master and Father of all and of our Savior Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit. For Christ also said, unless you are regenerated, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. In order that we might not remain children of ignorance and necessity, but become children of choice and knowledge, and might obtain the forgiveness of sins committed in the past, there is called in the water upon the one who chooses to be regenerated and who repents of sins, the name of God, the Master and Father of all, and he continues referring and describing Christ and the Holy Spirit. This bath is called illumination, since those who learn these things are illuminated in their understanding. Uh, Justin Martyr elaborates on the Trinitarian name, probably for the benefit of his uh, Gentile readers. Uh, immersion is implied, go to where there is water, and uh, faith and repentance are required. In fact, uh, this is uh, stated twice. Uh, in section 2, he says, as many as are persuaded and believe the things said and taught by us are true and promise to be able to live accordingly. And then again in section 10, the one who chooses to be regenerated and who repents of sins. So this author gives a strong emphasis to the requirement of faith and uh, repentance. Some elaboration of the baptismal ceremony is in evidence. Uh, one prepares by prayer and uh, fasting. We saw that also uh, in the Didache. And Justin says that baptism brings forgiveness of sins. It brings illumination and he associates that with the instruction that accompanied baptism. And it brings regeneration. He paraphrases uh, John chapter 3 verse 5. Well, with these two early accounts before us, now I want us to turn to a uh, topical uh, discussion of uh, aspects of baptism in early Christian literature. And I begin with the action of baptism and call attention to indications of submersion. And you'll notice that was the first choice in uh, the document known as the Didache. In uh, the epistle of Barnabas, and this is not the New Testament Barnabas, uh, from the early 2nd century, we have this statement, that we go down into the water full of sins and uncleanness, and we come up bearing its fruit in our heart, repentance, and having hope in Jesus in our spirit. The effort to make the going down and coming up refer to entering and exiting the water instead of the baptism itself is not the natural way uh, to take uh, these words. Seems to me to be a description of immersion. Uh, the earliest uh, surviving treatise on the subject of baptism is by Tertullian on baptism about the year uh, 200. And Tertullian says there is no difference whether one is washed in the sea or in a pond, a river or a fountain, a lake or a tub, nor is there a distinction between those whom John dipped in the Jordan and those whom Peter dipped in the Tiber unless that eunuch whom Philip dipped in the chance water found on their way obtained more or less of salvation. So Tertullian indicates now a time when you are not concerned with the kind of water uh, that the compiler of the Didache uh, was. Uh, Tertullian is uh, making the point from, in the passage from which this selection is taken 
that the Spirit sanctifies all water, uh, not just uh, running water uh, that the Didache preferred. And he uses the Latin words for dip, uh, tingo and uh, mergo. Uh, moving forward to the mid-4th uh, century, this selection from Cyril of Jerusalem's catechetical lectures. For as the one who plunges into the waters and is baptized is encompassed on all sides by the waters, so were they, he's referring to the apostles, also baptized completely by the Holy Spirit. He's referring to Acts 2. The water, however, flows around the outside only, but the Spirit baptizes also the soul within, and that uh, completely. I think we could not have a more explicit description of total submersion uh, than this, that one is encompassed on all sides uh, by uh, the water. From the latter part of the fourth century, uh, John Chrysostom in his homilies on John, where he was commenting on uh, John chapter th uh, 3 verse 5, he says, exactly as in some tomb, when we sink our heads in water, the old man is buried, and as he is submerged below, he is absolutely and entirely hidden. Then when we lift our heads up, the new man again comes up. Well, this too is a very explicit description of a total immersion, a full submersion under the water. And in another passage that I do not have the quotation for you, Chrysostom speaks of the priest guiding the hand down so as to dip or lean the head forward. And uh, that is what he is describing uh, here, but uh, less explicitly than in that other passage. We are accustomed to immersing by laying the person backward and submerging them in the water in that way. But Chrysostom and some other authors are suggesting an immersion by bending the person forward and uh, immersing in that manner. Uh, some of us who have observed uh, immersions in bathtubs in the Eastern Europe or in shallow streams in Africa know that there are various ways in which you can accomplish an immersion. And uh, our usual practice in this country of laying the body back horizontally is not the only way of getting them under the water. And uh, this early practice has some advantages, I think. We'll see that when we look at some of the pictures of baptistries uh, tomorrow. But Chrysostom is describing a forward immersion, bending the body uh, forward, and the person administering the baptism guides the head under the water, and then the person raises his head up again. We saw that the Didache allowed an exception to immersion in circumstances where there was a lack of water. Nobody else in the ancient world picked up on that uh, suggestion. That's an isolated statement in the Didache. But there was another circumstance that is some, several times referred to when a substitute for immersion was allowed. And this was in cases of a sickbed or deathbed baptism. The earliest description of this practice we have comes from Cyprian, a bishop of Carthage in the mid-third century. He is writing a letter in response to someone who has asked his opinion about sickbed baptism. He says, you have asked also what I thought concerning those who obtain God's grace in sickness and weakness, whether they are to be accounted legitimate Christians because they are not washed with the water of salvation, but have it poured on them. 
And then I've omitted a rather long section here. I summarize it by saying that Cyprian says each bishop then should judge what he thinks is right and act accordingly. And then he gives his own judgment. The divine blessings can in no way be mutilated and weakened. In the sacrament of salvation, when necessity compels and God bestows his mercy, the divine abridgments confer the whole benefit on believers. Nor should anyone be troubled that sick persons seem to be sprinkled or poured upon when they obtain the Lord's grace. Whence it appears that the sprinkling of water also holds equally with the washing of salvation. Notice that he's using the word wash for an immersion. Uh, washing here is contrasted with the sprinkling and pouring. When this is done in the church, where the faith both of the receiver and giver is sound, all things may stand firm and be consummated and perfected by the majesty of the Lord and the truth of the faith. Cyprian calls this practice of pouring or sprinkling an abridgment or an abbreviation and he's responding to those who questioned the practice. And since it was not the normal procedure, Cyprian insists that everything else had to be in order. It is a testimony to the importance attached to baptism that it was considered better to have a substitute for immersion than not to do anything uh, at all. The only reason that you would allow pouring as in the Didache or pouring and sprinkling in Cyprian is because it's so important that it be done. If it were not important, you would not worry about how uh, it was done. But in an emergency, imminent death kind of situations, it was justified and uh, became uh, an accepted alternative in those circumstances. But this was not the usual procedure. Uh, later indications of pouring are explicitly sickbed baptisms or can be explained as such. As part of the action of baptism, the emphasis was that it had to be done in the triune name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We saw that in the passages we've already read. Irenaeus, in the late second century, in his demonstration of the apostolic preaching, says, First of all, the faith admonishes us to remember that we have received baptism for remission of sins in the name of God the Father, and in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became incarnate and died and was raised, and in the Holy Spirit of God. Irenaeus here gives an enlarged specification of what faith in Christ uh, included. Somewhere about his time, around 200 at the beginning of the 3rd century, we have evidence that triple immersion was commonly done. Uh, the first reference to this is in Tertullian's work on the crown. He says, we are immersed three times, making a somewhat ampler pledge than the Lord has appointed in uh, the gospel. It has been suggested that this ampler pledge is the confession in response to three questions. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? But I rather think that this ampler pledge is referring to the triple immersion. And uh, a later Christian author, Jerome, read Tertullian uh, in that way. There have been various theories proposed as to the reason for a triple immersion. But I rather think that the triune name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, suggested the practice but other factors may have been involved. Now something about the recipients of baptism. Baptism was for those who believed and repented. 
We saw Justin Martyr's stress on those elements. The epistle of Barnabas says, Perceive how he defines the water and the cross together. For he says this, Blessed, he's doing an exposition of Psalm 1, Blessed are those who with hope in the cross went down into uh, the water. Uh, Barnabas often uses hope where we would say the word believe. He says the water and the cross together are the means of forgiveness. It's not water apart from the cross, but the water and the wood uh, together. Another writing from the first half of the second century, Hermas, in his mandates or commandments, has this passage. I said I heard from some teachers that there is no other repentance except that one when we went down into the water and received the forgiveness of our former sins. This is part of a discussion whether there is repentance for post-baptismal sins. That's something we'll not uh, uh, get into uh, here. I quote though this passage because of its important association of repentance with baptism. The repentance that accompanies the going down into uh, the water. And uh, repentance was expressed verbally in the ceremony of baptism from uh, uh, at least the early third century. This verbalized repentance took the form of a renunciation of the devil. In the work known as the apostolic tradition, we have this passage. And when the presbyter or the elder grasps each one of those who will receive baptism, let him command him to renounce, saying, I renounce you, Satan, with all your service and all your works. The wording varies in some of the other accounts, but uh, it always has the name of Satan or the devil as part of that uh, renunciation. And I've described that as a verbalized repentance. You're making a break with the pagan world, you're making a break with the service of Satan, and now are identifying yourself with Christ. When I was presenting this material a while back, someone who has done a lot of mission work in Haiti informed me that the Haitian preachers did the same thing. That at baptism they called upon people to renounce, to make a break with their service to the evil spirits and to their religious past. And I'm quite sure those Haitian preachers knew nothing about early Christian literature and this early Christian practice. But they were functioning in a comparable situation where people were coming out of paganism and identifying with Christianity. And so they made a similar response to what early Christians did in asking the converts to make an explicit renunciation of their religious past as they entered into uh, the church and the Christian faith. This verbalized repentance was paralleled by a verbalized faith, the confession of faith. The apostolic tradition, after describing the renunciation, uh, says, Thus he descends into the waters. The presbyter places his hand on his head and questions him, saying, Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? He who is baptized replies, I believe. Then he immerses him in the water once, his hand on his head. And afterward, let him say, Do you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God? And he goes on to elaborate about Christ. And when he has said, I believe, let him be immersed again. And again let him say, Do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the flesh? Then let him who is being baptized say, I believe. And so let him be immersed a third time. The importance of faith and repentance 
and the expression of faith and repentance is underscored by the minimum requirements in those cases of sickbed or deathbed baptism. In an emergency situation, the full liturgy of baptism that had developed in the third and fourth centuries was no longer uh, possible. So what was considered essential to the baptism when you are hurrying uh, to accomplish this before the death of a person? Basil, Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, in the uh, latter part of the fourth century, says in one of his exhortations to baptism, Why do you wait for a fever for baptism to become a gift to you? When you are not able to utter the saving words, nor are inclined to hear purely, nor to be taught profitably, nor to confess safely, nor to reach agreement with God, nor to renounce the enemy, nor to follow intelligently being initiated. Here Basil emphasizes the things that he considered essential for a proper and effective baptism. You have to be able to utter the saving words. Uh, you have to have been taught you must confess, you reach an agreement with God, you renounce of the enemy, you must understand intelligently what is going on. Well, these descriptions of the recipients of baptism then naturally raise for us the question of infant baptism. The emphasis in early Christian writers is on the innocence of children. Out of multiple passages, I'll read one from the Apology of Aristides early in the second century. He's describing Christian conduct to pagans. And he says, And when a child has been born to one of them, the Christians, they give thanks to God. And if it should die as an infant, they give thanks the more, because it has departed life sinless. Well, this sentiment is strange uh, to me, but it is a powerful testimony to the early Christian conviction that young children are in a saved uh, state and uh, underscores what many other writers say about uh, their innocence. Uh, the first certain reference to the practice of infant baptism occurs in uh, Tertullian's treatise on baptism from around the year uh, 200. According to the circumstances and nature and also age of each person, the delay of baptism is more suitable, especially in the case of small children. What is the necessity, if there is no such necessity, for the sponsors as well to be brought into danger? since they may fail to keep their promises by reason of death or be deceived by an evil disposition which grows up in the child. The Lord indeed says, do not forbid them to come to me. Let them come then while they are growing up, while they are learning, while they are instructed why they are coming. Let them become Christians when they are able to know Christ. In what respect does the innocent period of life hasten to the remission of sins? Should we act more cautiously in worldly matters so that divine things were given to those to whom earthly property is not given? Let them learn to ask for salvation so that you may be seen to have given to him who asks. Well, Tertullian's testimony is that infant baptism was being done and was accepted. But in view of Tertullian's usual acceptance of traditional practices, it must be a relatively recent development, or he would not be opposing it. He mentions the presence of sponsors to guarantee Christian instruction of the child. And Tertullian seems to allow for emergency baptism if there is a necessity. More of that in a moment. Notice the use of Matthew 18 verse 3, allow the little children to come to me, as already being cited 
uh, in support of the practice. Tertullian joins a chorus of voices affirming the innocence of children and he states the purpose of baptism as forgiveness and he affirms the necessity of conscious choice. I want to refer now to some inscriptions that are very revealing about the circumstances that gave rise in my mind to infant baptism. One inscription and the early Christian inscriptions begin in the third uh, century. Uh, some of them cannot be exactly dated. Sweet Tiki lived one year, ten months, fifteen days, received grace on the eighth day before the Calends, gave up the soul on the same day. Notice that she is baptized but nearly two years old and receives baptism the same day that she dies. There's obviously a correlation of when the baptism was administered and the time of, uh, of death. This was not a routine baptism of an infant. She's nearly two years old. Now notice uh, another inscription. Forentius made this monument for his well-deserving son, Apronianus, who lived one year, nine months, and five days. Since he was dearly loved by his grandmother, and she saw that he was going to die, she asked from the church that he might depart from the world a believer. Well, these inscriptions and many others show a close correlation between the time of baptism and the time of death, which was soon after. These inscriptions, which refer to the baptism of a child, indicate that it was not a routine practice. This evidence suggests to me what was the true origin of infant baptism. It was a concern for the child that it not die unbaptized. And the conviction of the necessity of baptism for going to heaven came from an absolutizing interpretation of John 3 verse 5. Unless one be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That verse was generalized and absolutized and that conviction came to prevail over the conviction of the innocence of children and their being in a saved state. Well, when then did infant baptism become a normal practice? An important figure in this development is Augustine, who was Bishop of Hippo in the early 5th century. Augustine was an advocate of original sin and he was engaged in a controversy with the Pelagians who denied uh, that doctrine. I'll give you one passage which will summarize Augustine's arguments. Those people, the Pelagians, grant that little ones should be baptized because they cannot stand up against the authority which was beyond any doubt given to the whole church through the Lord and the Apostles. The Pelagians accepted uh, infant baptism, not with a great deal of enthusiasm, but it was being commonly done, and as Augustine says, they don't want to break with the custom of the church, and so uh, they accepted it. Now, from that, Augustine's reasoning proceeds. They should then also grant that the little ones need these benefits of the mediator so that washed by the sacrament they might be reconciled to God. Thus they would become in him living, saved, set free, redeemed, and enlightened. From what? Saved from sin, guilt, and darkness of sins. And since they committed at that age no sin in their own life, there remains only 
original sin. Well, the argument here has to do with the doctrine of original sin, which Augustine is promoting. The Pelagians accepted infant baptism, and that proved to be the fatal weakness in their arguments with Augustine. Notice that Augustine argues from infant baptism to original sin. The accepted doctrine of baptism was that it was for the forgiveness of sins. Infants had committed no sins of their own. Their baptism, therefore, must be to forgive original sin. Well, after Augustine's doctrine prevailed, as it did in the Western Church, the reasoning was reversed. Original sin became the reason for infant baptism. And so it is still today for Roman Catholics and certain Protestant bodies. The Eastern Church did not follow this path, but justified infant baptism from the other benefits of baptism. Well, these uh, remarks lead us now to the last major uh, unit of our study, the uh, doctrine of uh, baptism. Among the gifts associated with baptism, I'll select two for comment because these are the most frequently mentioned. Baptism brings forgiveness of sins. That epistle of Barnabas again says, Let us inquire if the Lord was careful to give a revelation in advance concerning the water and the cross. It was written concerning the water with regard to Israel, how they will not receive the baptism that brings forgiveness of sins, but will establish another for themselves. Barnabas is referring here to the Jewish washings for purification that we discussed uh, yesterday morning. And his contrast is that Christian baptism brings forgiveness of sins, but that was not what Jewish baptism did. Another statement now from Theophilus, who was a bishop of Antioch in the latter part of the second century, in an apologetic writing to Odalicus. He is giving a commentary on the days of creation in Genesis 1. He says, On the fifth day of creation came into existence the living creatures from the waters, through which the manifold wisdom of God is made plain. Moreover, the things that come from uh, the waters were blessed by God. In order that this might be a sign that people were going to receive repentance and forgiveness of sins through water. And the bath of regeneration, Titus 3.5. Namely, all those who come to the truth and are born again, the language of John 3.5 now, and receive a blessing uh, from uh, God. Uh, this is an early use of Titus 3.5 combined with John 3.5. Well, a second gift associated with baptism was the Holy Spirit. Baptism brings the Holy Spirit. Uh, Irenaeus, in his demonstration of the apostolic preaching, says, When there abides constantly in them the Holy Spirit, who is given by him in uh, baptism. Well, these are two uh, common uh, gifts uh, mentioned in connection with baptism. Now I'd like to refer to the two most common images for baptism. One of these is that of new birth. Uh, this was the most popular uh, image in the uh, second and early third uh, centuries. In Clement of Alexandria's uh, prophetic eclogues, he refers to regeneration, the John 3.5 language, is of water and spirit. Baptism occurs through water and spirit. Well, regeneration or new birth is of water and spirit. Tertullian, in his treatise on baptism, says Christians are little fishes born in water. It is prescribed that without baptism, no person can obtain salvation. Uh, this standing rule, he says, derives from the Lord's pronouncement in John 3, uh, verse 5. 
And indeed, as I observed in the question period yesterday, John 3 verse 5 was the most quoted baptismal text in the second century. There was no doubt in the early church that water here was the water of baptism. Well, the other common image for baptism was that of death, burial, and resurrection. And this became the common image uh, used in the uh, fourth century, yet of course deriving from Paul's words uh, in Romans 6. Uh, Basil of Caesarea in his treatise on the Holy Spirit says, How then do we achieve the descent into Hades? By imitating through baptism the burial of Christ. For the bodies of the baptized are as it were buried in the water. Baptism is a type of the resurrection of the dead. For this cause, the Lord, who is the dispenser of our life, gave us the covenant of baptism, containing a type of life and death. For the water fulfills the image of death, and the Spirit gives us the earnest of life. Well, Basil is an important uh, Greek author in the 4th century. Now a quotation from an important Latin author, Ambrose, uh, Bishop of Milan in the late 4th century. In his work on the sacraments, he says, We are plunged and emerge. That is, we are raised up. In baptism, since there is a likeness of death, without doubt when you dip and rise again, there is made a likeness of the resurrection. The immersion was commonly exploited by 4th century authors as teaching identification with the burial and resurrection of Christ. Now I'll add uh, something for which I do not have uh, uh, slides for you. Early Christian authors made use of Old Testament types of baptism. The creation was one of those because of the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters. That association of water and spirit suggested baptism to them. Another common type was the flood of Noah drawn from 1 Peter chapter 3, of course. And then in order to fit the theme of this uh, lectureship, I want to call attention to the use of the Exodus uh, typology in reference to baptism. This derived, of course, from Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Origen, in his homilies on Exodus, says that you also who are baptized in Christ, in water and the Holy Spirit, might know that the Egyptians, and in his comparison they stand for spiritual evils, in order that you may know that the Egyptians are following you and wish to recall you to their service. These attempt to follow, but you descend into the water and come out unimpaired, the filth of sins having been washed away. You ascend a new man, prepared to sing a new song. But the Egyptians who follow you are drowned in the abyss. Well, there is a great deal in early Christian literature that I think is uh, supportive of our understanding in churches of Christ of the practice and uh, doctrine of uh, baptism. We've seen some of the differences, some of the changes, but the overall weight of the evidence uh, suggests that in uh, answering the question that I gave as the title for this series of lessons, have we misunderstood baptism? That no, we have not. The testimony of history uh, to Christian practice uh, is in general very uh, supportive of our position. We only have a minute or two to le uh, left, so I don't know whether to open for questions or not, but if you have something that would permit a quick answer, uh, I suppose we could do that. Yes, Winston? We're used to saying you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Is there any connection of the blood of Jesus and the symbolism of death in Romans 6? In other words, where does the blood... 
as an individual. Is there any any connection there at all? We used to sing that song, you know, yeah. working with the local lamb. Well, uh, he's asking, is there a connection with being washed in the blood of the Lamb uh, with, uh, with baptism? Normally, these are two different images uh, that are applied, but they're different ways of revealing the same truth, I, I think, that uh, the blood of Christ would be applied to us at the time of, uh, of the immersion. Uh, the real cleansing comes from the blood of Christ. But the time at which it occurs is when God has appointed uh, in the uh, washing of baptism. And the early Christian writers make a lot of the fact that water is the normal means of cleansing uh, from filth. And so that made it an appropriate image uh, for what God does uh, at that time. Well, thank you for your presence this morning. Tomorrow we're going to... Uh, turn from the literary sources to the art and archaeological uh, evidence. And so instead of having to look at words on the screen, we'll let you look at pictures uh, tomorrow. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, please leave a like on the video and be sure to leave a comment underneath telling us what you thought about the video. And please subscribe to our channel for more content like this. All right, I hope everyone has a great day.